Sounds good. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our November Chamber University program. Uh, we are so pleased to uh, have our guests with us today. Uh, Lisa Ellen Smith with Inverve Marketing will be speaking uh, on building your online marketing and um, uh, sales strategy. Uh, we are going to give just a couple of minutes uh, for the technology to kind of work its way through, allow everybody to get connected, and then we will kick the program off. If you have not had the opportunity to attend a Chamber University program uh, with the Chamber yet, uh, these programs are really designed to help uh, small to medium-sized businesses in particular and provide them with tools, tips, tricks, resources to really help folks maximize their, their time and money, um, two of the most precious resources we have as, uh, as business professionals. Uh, obviously, we're utilizing the Zoom platform that we are all so familiar with by, by this point. Uh, with a webinar, uh, we are utilizing the Q&A function. Um, so if you have questions as Lisa is going through her presentation, uh, please drop those in the Q&A uh, box. We will either get to them during the course of the program, or we have left some time uh, at the end of the program to address the questions as well. Uh, we are so pleased to work uh, with some great sponsors for our Chamber University program. Uh, they are supported by Fraser Law Firm and also uh, by Fifth Third Bank. We are pleased to have uh, Jody Promer, Vice President of Business Relationship Manager, to say a few words. Uh, and just a big thank you to uh, for both of our sponsors for your continued support and leadership. So Jody, if you'd like to uh, address the crowd, that'd be great. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Michelle, and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to Ta Chamber University. Uh, Fifth Third Bank has been a proud sponsor of this program since its, it, since it, its inception. Easier for uh, to say than to, anyhow. Uh, so Fifth Third Bank, uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we're a super regional bank uh, headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, 170 billion in assets. That makes us about the 15th largest bank in the country. Um, locally, we operate uh, 12 branches in the Lansing market. I'm happy to say that all of our branches have been open uh, through uh, the, the COVID pandemic and are still open every day to, to serve our customers. Um, so if you're following the financial markets and, and so on, uh, you'll know that it's a historic uh, low interest rate environment. So I just want to make a mention that uh, if, if you haven't looked into to refinancing on your home or to, it's a great time to purchase a home, great time to do home improvement projects, uh, or if you're a business owner, it's an excellent time to purchase equipment, uh, refinance real estate. And in addition to that, there's also some enhanced SBA programs right now for business owners that allow 100% financing, longer amortizations and so forth. So if Fifth Third Bank can help you uh, with any of your personal business needs, uh, please keep us in mind. And um, with that, uh, Michelle, we'll kick it back over to you. Thank awesome. You. Again, thank you so much for, for your continued support. Um, this Chamber University, I think, provides such a critical growth and education resource for our business community. So again, thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, now to kind of lead into today's program, uh, as I mentioned before, it's really looking at building an online sales and marketing strategy. Uh, to that end, we are pleased to have Lisa Ellen Smith, president of Inverb Marketing, with us. Uh, as we uh, all have experienced, uh, website traffic is up, way up. Um, but is your website accurately representing your brand? Is it generating leads? Is it telling a compelling story? Uh, Lisa is going to show you how to attract more visitors to your site, to identify those visitors that are your best leads, and then how to nurture those relationships into long-term customers. So all things that were critically important uh, before the pandemic, but even more so as we uh, look at a challenging winter and first part of 2021. So Lisa, please share your screen and take us away. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Let me get into presentation mode here. Are you seeing uh, my screen, building an online sales and marketing strategy? I am. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Jody, for sponsoring these terrific programs from the Chamber. And thank you, Michelle. Uh, I've had the pleasure this year of joining the Board of Directors for the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I'm very um, invested in helping build business, uh, not only am I a, a supporter and 
and on the board for the chamber. I'm also with the Small Business Association of Michigan Leadership Council. Uh, I'm active and on the advisory committee for uh, Athena, Executive uh, Connections, and PowerLink. So I spend most of my volunteer hours advocating for business and business growth. And um, I am the president of Inverv Marketing. Um, we've been in Old Town for uh, almost 20 years now. You can see the Jazz Fest posters behind me. So uh, obviously I'm a big fan of the Jazz Fest. I've performed there multiple times and uh, just love Lansing a lot. So let's get started. Um, the talk today is about uh, building, uh, let me just, let me get rid of uh, something off my screen here. So our talk today is building an online marketing and sales strategy. Um, Inverve Marketing has, uh, we have been in digital marketing. We took a big hard turn into digital in about 2012 through 2014, we started to reshape our shop. We do still do traditional marketing, lots of television, uh, radio, billboard type campaigns and graphic design and branding. But the specialty that we've really become known for is inbound marketing. And so we're gonna talk today about building an inbound marketing program. T today, our presentation is really applicable for uh, business to business companies. So companies that do business with other businesses, a business to consumers, but with a more considered purchase. Uh, maybe you um, have a higher ticket price or there's a very long loyalty component to your brand. Nonprofit organizations, associations, and membership organizations. Um, because we're not gonna get into specific campaign building today, I wanted to offer up a helpful piece of content to guide you as you're doing inbound campaigns. Hopefully you're gonna build a plan and a strategy and create some campaigns and launch them or build on the campaigns you currently have. Uh, this piece of content will help you cover all of your bases as you plan and implement. So if you want a copy of this inbound campaign checklist, just email me at lisa at inverfmarketing.com. So today, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about what to do to get started in inbound, how to identify inbound targets and set your goals, technology stacks, how to get some quick wins out of digital marketing, customer communication and reducing friction from your flywheel, marketing and sales alignment, and paid advertising. So the most common question that we get from people who come to the shop and start to, to talk with us about what they need uh, is really, what do we do now? Uh, maybe they're already doing digital marketing. Uh, generally, if they're coming to us, they're a digital marketer. They just don't quite know where to begin. Digital is an enormous discipline in marketing. Uh, you've got an entire entire section that's dedicated to e-commerce, shopping carts, uh, non-considered purchases that are impulse buys uh, like Amazon and uh, Shopify sites. That's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about digital marketers who have a, a more broader focus in the business to business or considered purchase community. So they ask us, where do we go now? There's just a lot to learn. It's very complicated. Uh, it can be very time consuming to get up to speed in digital marketing. My staff alone, every single person, including our office manager, has some kind of marketing certification. Our office manager got inbound marketing certification just to make sure he could represent a question in case somebody asked. Uh, and then how do I know it's going to make a difference? So what should I be looking at? Today, we're going to give you some simple infrastructure so that you can put that framework in place. I'll show you how to break down this complex discipline into an easy framework by identifying your inbound targets, choosing some tactics that will help you grow your inbound performance, and align your sales department. So this framework can be used whether you're just building a plan or you're an experienced marketer that wants to market and grow better. Um, this is a graph that I've been using since the beginning of time. Uh, it's called the inbound marketing methodology. And it really is a nice, simple, basic representation of what digital inbound marketing uh, methodology looks like. 
So how do we build an inbound plan for any given client? We manage the gaps by identifying current metrics and analytics. So the first thing you wanna do in building your framework is to benchmark your own inbound metrics. When we begin uh, the discovery phase with a client, the first thing we do is just get some very simple basic metrics. How much web traffic is coming to your website each month? And these are things that you wanna pull, you wanna be looking at as the most basic measure of your inbound metrics. How many leads are coming from your website each month? And that's in the convert phase. So you're attracting people to your website. You're using blogs, social media, optimized landing pages, keywords, uh, and people are strangers. So the strangers, they don't know who you are, but they're searching the web and they're finding you through these kinds of tactics. So strangers are attracted through tactics. Once somebody becomes a visitor to your website, our goal then is to find out if they are really truly a marketing or sales qualified lead. If they are, and they're somebody who really are seriously interested in doing business with you, we're gonna use conversion tactics like call to action buttons, optimized landing pages. We'll put forms on pages and then ask them to become a contact in our system. Uh, this is not anything new to people who are um, on websites. They know that if they become a contact in your system, they're probably going to get marketed too. So that means they're a pretty interested lead at that point. Once they're a lead in your database, our goal is to really close them through lead nurturing. So lead nurturing can happen through email, email automation, or something that we call workflows. Some programs help you do lead scoring so you know how interested a party is. Client relationship management integration. Uh, there's a host of tactics that we'll talk about here as well that can nurture a lead into a customer. And then of course, once somebody's a customer, we don't wanna be just done with them. They're not gonna walk out your door digitally. We wanna make sure that we're giving them other opportunities to be delighted by your brand, to become a brand maven, a brand promoter. And we're gonna do that through things like social media, smart call to action buttons, email marketing, workflows. And additionally, in this delight phase, if you have a happy customer, you can upsell, cross sell, resell to those customers. So that becomes another opportunity for revenue. Uh, additionally, last thing, we want them to promote the brand. So if they really love who you are and somebody says, hey, um, you know, I'm looking for XYZ, they're gonna say, oh, you should work with this company. They did a great job for me. So that's really benchmarking your metrics. So attract phase is how many people, what is the web traffic count per month? Converting means how many leads is your website converting from visitor to lead? It's called a visitor to lead conversion. And then the lead to customer conversion is how many people were nurtured from the lead stage into a customer? And then of course, once they're a customer, we want to see what attributions influence that purchase and to help create more revenue with additional sales. Are there any questions at this point about what we're covering? No, um, well, excuse me, I stand corrected. There was one question about marketing certif uh, certifications. Which ones would you recommend? Um, well, if you have uh, if you have access to HubSpot, I recommend HubSpot certifications first and foremost. Uh, figure just the inbound certification is free. It's online. It's called inbound marketing, and then from there, uh, I think some of the most helpful certifications that I personally have are Google AdWords. Really understand that ecosystem of Google. Uh, there's a fantastic SEO certification from. Um, uh, it's not, oh, we don't use the software anymore, but it was, oh, SEMrush. 
So their SEO certification, I believe that's free as well. We happen to have had a subscription to that um, software. So the SEO certification will help you identify on-page and off-page SEO recommendations. Those are some of the basic. Um, we have some people in our shop that have gotten the Facebook blueprint certification. So if you're gonna do a lot of social media uh, marketing, then I would highly recommend that. Um, there's, a, there's so many. Um, and if you want to have a conversation offline, you can always email me. Great question. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, sure. So what are your opportunities? You've pulled your numbers from your website and let's say your web traffic is a thousand visitors per month. You're getting 50 leads from your website, five customers, and we're not gonna really talk about this part because that gets a little bit in the weeds for us. So what we wanna understand is this is your current traffic. What you wanna do from here is set some inbound goals. So let's say your goal is 20 customers per month. Do a little bit of reverse engineering and figure out what inbound targets become numbers that are going to help you get to that goal. So if you need, for example, if we're focusing in on web traffic, if you need 20 customers per month, and this is a conversion rate that works for your company, you're going to have to do four times the web traffic in order to get 20 customers per month. So plan to increase your web traffic to 4,000 visitors, or you can plan to convert more leads from 1,000 visitors to leads, or you can plan to convert, convert more leads to customers. It depends on if you feel like you have a lot of traffic, you're getting plenty of leads, but a 10% close ratio is too low for you, then let's start to work on how well you're converting and nurturing those leads. If we need to get more web traffic, we're gonna look at the tactics to help you attract more visitors. So this really becomes your tactical uh, blueprint. So where are you gonna manage the gaps in your inbound funnel? So let's take a look at this sales funnel. Um, we looked at methodology and planning. Once you've set your inbound targets, then it's time to look at your sales cycle. So we used to put, we used to talk about the sales funnel. This is a this is what we used to look at. Uh, there'd be this big broad top of the funnel, and you would use things like advertising, promotion, salespeople, uh, reputation had a a bit to do with that. And those are the things that would push people into your sales funnel. They would drop in there. They would be a visitor then they would become a lead, marketing qualified, sales qualified, a real opportunity, and then hopefully you push them out the other end and they are a customer. And then you move on and you continue to manage the sales funnel. But digital marketing is more like a wheel. It's more like a flywheel. Your efforts are not linear. They're not driven by humans. They're driven by software. They're driven by algorithms, automation, artificial intelligence driven. So there's really a new kind of idea. The sales funnel is dead, the flywheel is born. So once you start to attract people to your website and they engage with your brand and become part of a database and you sell them and delight them, the sales funnel doesn't stop from there. The attraction tactics that you are using continue to pull people into your funnel or into the flywheel. And the flywheel, the stronger it is with the less amount of friction, gets cranking better and better all the time. Whereas pre-digital, you really had to rely on salespeople or advertising to attract prospects. So let's zero in. Uh, let's say you've decided in your inbound targets that you want to attract more people to your website. This is a collection of some of the most commonly used tactics to attract people to your website. So digital knowledge management. Um, this is, we also call this NAP, it's, uh, which very simply stands for name, address, and phone. And it's about how are you listed 
how are you represented online? So for example, Google Local Business Center might have your information. You have to claim that listing and you have to manage it. So um, let's see, for example, if you are closing for a week for Thanksgiving, you're gonna wanna make sure that the hours of operation are reflected there. If you change your hours seasonally, you're open at 9 a.m. instead of 8 a.m., you wanna make sure that that's properly listed in uh, search listings. There are, if you have a very broad footprint, we have several clients who are national and uh, they can't really go out and find all of the listings. This is in particular, like for example, a restaurant where they're gonna be in multiple communities and uh, have a massive footprint. Uh, you can use software, something uh, we, we've used Yext and that really manages that di digital listing for you. Um, but you wanna make sure that things are correct. Um, keyword strategy is important. Landing pages, attracting people optimized with proper keywords. Uh, pillar page strategy, which is really focusing in on certain ideas and then maximizing that with multiple pieces of content that are interconnected on your website. Optimize blogs with proper keywords, your URLs, uh, your SSL certificate on your website. Your page load speed is something that's going to affect your SEO. Uh, canonicals, redirects, title tags, uh, your headings on your website, H1, H2, H3, meta descriptions, and there are more, but this is a really common group that you can focus in on and really move the needle with if you're trying to attract more people to your website. Um, backlinks in particular are one, uh, so this is when one website links to another website, very important for on-page SEO. Uh, other websites that have authority have a positive effect on a site's ranking and search visibility. So for example, if you can get a listing on the Chamber of Commerce website, then do that because the Chamber of Commerce is gonna be seen as somebody with high ranking, high search visibility and page authority. Um, we had a situation, I'll just tell you some anecdotally that um, one of the most mature inbound marketing clients that we have is a company called Indian Trails of Michigan. And when we first started working them, with them and their website, uh, they were, they had a page called regular route service. So what that means is if you want to buy a bus ticket and you want to see what regular routes are in place to go from one city to another city, you could click on regular route service. So we took a look at that page and found that in terms of keywords, nobody was searching regular route service. Uh, what we found for a better keyword was bus tickets. And so we took a look at what is the opportunity there. Uh, and they were not on the first 10 pages of the Google search with regular route service. So we changed their title tag, their H1 and their navigation to say bus tickets within about a month they were number three in search engines right behind Greyhound for bus tickets. So sometimes small things can make really big differences when you're looking to attract more visitors and the right visitors to your website. Uh, the next stage of your sales funnel that you can choose tactics for if you're interested in converting more visitors to leads is the engage stage. So here are some common tactics that you would use in order to engage people to become a lead in your lead management system. So they're a stranger, they come to your website and they find a call to action button and they click on that button. So some of the tactics that you would use here are call to action buttons, landing pages, written content, downloadable content. And by downloadable content, I mean helpful offers, checklists, guides, um, things that would be helpful for someone in, that wants to do business in your business industry or category. Um, for, I just, uh, last week I spoke for nonprofits, uh, inbound marketing for nonprofits. It was a conference that they had. And um, there were some really great ideas that came there for nonprofits. Uh, for example, downloadable content on, say, for example, the state of, so the state of 
food insecurity today in America or with COVID-19. So you can download this content if you're highly uh, engaged with that topic and get informed. Other things, promotional offers, uh, having forms to fill out on your website are critical. Contacts, testimonials, case studies, white papers, those are really uh, content options. Chatbots and chatbot responding, email workflows, videos, pop-ups and pop-up forms, and personalization. Uh, one of the things that I was talking about last week in the uh, uh, Inbound for Nonprofits um, conference is call to action buttons. I did a half hour session just on call to action buttons. So just to uh, give you some best practices there, everything you do should have a call to action button on it. Every ad should click through to something. Advertising should never click through to your homepage, by the way. Uh, every blog, website page, email, put call to action buttons on everything that you do so that you can nurture someone to the next stage of engaging with your brand. Uh, and then content, I think, is really the most important thing that you can uh, create a plan for. Your content strategy should be properly keyworded. It should tell your user what they can expect from your content, and it should be highly relevant and helpful. So let's talk a little bit more about content here. In the engage stage, it is content campaigns. So 70% of marketers are actively investing in content marketing. That means they're, they're writing blogs or they're having blogs written, they're writing white papers, helpful guides, um, and giving people information that they can engage with and download. I'm going to give you a real life example here. Again, we're gonna talk about Indian trails because number one, they've given me permission to talk about them. <laughs> and then number two, they just have done such an amazing job with inbound marketing. So if you go to the Indian Trails website, um, what you'll find below the fold, if you scroll down on the homepage, is this call to action button, planning a trip, get your complete guide to booking a bus. And then here is the call to action button, download the guide. Uh, so this is going to be really an example of a content strategy. You'll notice here that the intent is very, very clear. This is for people who are new customers. They're not savvy about booking a bus. They don't quite know what they're doing. And we want to engage them with the most helpful information that we can. Um, once you click on this call to action button, you're going to go to a form, a landing page specifically built to convert interested people into becoming a lead in the system. And they do that by wanting the complete guide to booking a bus. The landing page is really built to sell the offer. So if you don't know what you're doing, you can plan your trip armed with a complete understanding of charter bus companies and book like a professional planner. Now, I don't think anybody in the universe is gonna be interested in this offer unless they're really going to book a bus. So high intent, bottom of the funnel, but also engaging. So the 13 page guide is gonna give you insight into how to get a great quote, how to build an itinerary, sign up forms for traveler, travelers, medical emergency, parent permission forms, amenities that are available that the best fleets offer today. So if you're really interested in booking a bus and doing a good job beyond price, then this might be a guide that you're gonna download. And you would be surprised, thousands and thousands of people have downloaded this guide over the years. We've had three refreshes on this guide and it continues to convert to people who seriously are interested in booking a bus. I'm gonna say also, today, when we first built this offer, uh, it, was, it was a little uh, worrisome that we would be marketing to people who downloaded this guide. But today, people use the internet every day and they expect that you're going to market to them. 
And in after you download this guide, you get a series of other helpful emails. And those emails include things like um, uh, guides for teens, um, bus behavior, a blog about games you can play on buses. And every single one of those emails includes a call to action button that says request a quote. It's just right there in the email and you can convert from that email onto the page where you can input your quote information. So that is an example of a highly successful content campaign. And once you've got that piece of content that your prospective customers care about, then you can promote it. That's a content campaign beyond the website, right? So now you can promote it not only on your website, but you can put it in social media, you can promote it with paid advertising, you can put a call to action on blog posts that offer up the complete guide to booking a bus, you can create other landing pages for group planning and other kinds of keywords. So uh, that is the engage stage of inbound marketing. Let's move to the customer delight stage. Customer delight is the process of exceeding a customer's expectations to create a positive experience to improve loyalty. This does not mean bombarding people with advertising. What it means is being delightful and helpful. And that is how you really do inbound marketing well. Uh, I would add to that that delightful, helpful, and authentic to your brand. Speak with your voice. Speak with your own uh, culture in mind. Um, and, and then speak intentionally and specifically. So don't go off topic. If you, if you promise somebody the complete guide to booking a bus, uh, don't give them a checklist for booking a bus. Give them the complete guide. That's a different thing, a checklist. So be clear about your intent there. Uh, the delight stage, um, let's see, let's pause for questions because I don't have, uh, do we have any questions right now? You know, we don't have anything right now that couldn't really wait till the end um, to kind of drive uh, a little bit of a further discussion. Okay, great. Um, so we're in the delight stage of your inbound planning. Um, so for example, if you download the complete guide to booking a bus and then you book a bus, we want we don't wanna be done with you. We certainly wanna have a secondary plan for you. So perhaps um, a month after your first bus booking, um, we're gonna send you an email for $100 off your second charter booking or refer a friend program, uh, emails to a survey uh, we want your feedback. It's important to us. Sometimes also the delight phase uh, can be a successful way to create what we call brand proof. Um, so if a survey is successful, you can send yet another email saying, hey, would you mind giving us a review on Google or on Facebook? Um, and then once your flywheel is attracting visitors, those visitors are filling out forms, they become leads in your database. You can work on identifying the friction in your flywheel. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, just to really quickly go through these tactics that you might wanna choose secondary offers and promotions, email workflows, social media, smart call to actions, customer perk programs, personalization, feedback, surveys, net promoter scores, uh, customer service modules like knowledge bases, video, or uh, service tickets if you're in that kind of an industry. So let's take a quick minute and review where we are on building your plan. The framework thus far. So we have benchmarked the inbound metrics, how much website traffic is coming, how many leads are you getting, how many leads are you closing, and then from there you might be tracking revenue, return on investment, um, attribution reporting. Um, so you've got your inbound metrics. Determine your inbound targets. Where in the funnel do you want? Do you want to attract more traffic? Do you want to get more leads? 
do you want to close more customers? Uh, the next stage was set inbound goals and then choose which tactics you're going to be using. From here, the next step is to build your marketing and communication technology stack. Um, if you're not on board with technology, you got to get on board with technology. Uh, the point is you need software to do digital marketing, but also you need the right software. You want to avoid software that doesn't do enough for you tomorrow. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna buy this piece of software. Then you're gonna say, you know what? We also need this. And you're gonna buy that software. And what you're gonna end up with is with what we call Frankenware, the Frankenstein software program. So you've gotta log into this program to get that. You've gotta look at this dashboard to get that. You've gotta mash up these numbers to get ROI. What you really want is a piece of software that integrates enough information so that you can do digital marketing with the fewest numbers of dashboards possible. Decide what tactics require what software. So some of the things you want to think about are what is your website content management system? Some CMSs have a lot of built-in marketing technology. What email program are you working with? Uh, social media. Do you have a social media dashboard and uh, posting program, uh, sales CRMs, client relationship management should be part of your digital marketing mix. Lead generation, how are you generating leads, nurturing those leads and having them come out the other side? E-commerce, content, live chat or chat bots, analytics and data, and then on and on and on. So when we started to really look at what a marketing technology stack looks like, it gets very confusing. But the state of marketing today is it's really software as a service. Um, software as a service has grown to be the norm. Uh, you're not gonna be doing accounting on spreadsheets today. You're gonna be using software and you're not gonna be doing software on a program out of a box anymore. 73% of organizations indicate nearly all of their apps will be software as a service by 2021, which means that you pay an ongoing fee per month or per user or in some fashion um, over time. Uh, and this can be difficult. Um, we have an office manager. He's been with us for many years now. He started with us with an understanding of desktop QuickBooks. So the QuickBooks desktop, you buy it and you connect it and you host it and you use it and it doesn't ever update uh, and it doesn't communicate with other things. And so for a couple of years, I was poking at him because we now have a project management system that has an integration with QuickBooks online. So we can get real-time data and be doing things that, that connect each other from our billing system, our project management system. And so finally, a year ago, he moved to the software as a service project or product, uh, QuickBooks Online. But that's just one example of, of you know, moving to software. Companies with 50 or under employees have about 40 applications total, uh, while those with 1,000 employees have over 2,000 applications. The average cost on per employee for software as a service is over $2,000 today. So it's almost like a benefit uh, in terms of price tags. Small businesses average 75 software as a service applications. That's from 2019 and uh, MarTech Today website. The average company with 200 to 500 employees uses 123 software as a service applications. Again, 2019 data. So you can see uh, just bite the bullet, buy software, buy great software. So we wanted to, uh, last year I did, uh, I did a, a session for the Small Business Association of Michigan on MarTech and marketing technology systems. It's extremely complex. Uh, so when you think about your technology stack, think about what are your current needs, but also what are your future goals? Because you wanna buy software that's gonna grow with you uh, so for example, if you're only doing e email marketing right now, but you want to add embedded video into your email, 
you might need a new system. So think about, let's do email marketing, but let's find something because our future goal is to really create a lot of video content. So let's get an email marketing system with embedded video. Uh, another example is if you have a client relationship management system, but it doesn't allow you the ability to manage and analyze your paid ads to see where your sources of leads are coming from, you might want to think about that. Get a CRM that also helps you understand your traffic sources. So I put together this, and this, again, this is a year old. This is a marketing technology ecosystem. What it is, it's, it's software by category that's been vetted to work with national and international integrations. So some of the biggest pieces of software, who, who do they integrate with? So they're big enough to have integrations with the biggest software uh, companies, SaaS products on the market. So you'll see that these are categorically uh, placed. So if you need live chat, here are some options here. If you have content, SAS needs. Here are some programs you might want to look at and on and on analytics and data, lead generation, sales, video, uh, all kinds of different um, categories and options for you. So you don't have to Google something and really just find whoever's out there. And again, um, I will, I will email you this presentation at the end. Uh, if you email me and, um, then you can have this, um, this infographic for future reference. Uh, marketing communication technology. One of the things you really want to focus in on is how do your community, how do your customers or prospects communicate with you? Um, we have a client who gets a tremendous amount of communication through Facebook Messenger. They have a very active social media presence and Facebook Messenger is a place where a lot of messages are coming in. So they needed a piece of software that communicated with an inbox specifically from Facebook Messenger that had that integration built in. Uh, this matters. If your web traffic is converting with a phone call, for example, somebody comes to your website and sees that phone number or sees the phone number somewhere else, there's an amazing system called CallRail and it will help you identify the source of the phone call. So you know if it come what web page it came from, what digital ad it came from, if it was a referring website that it came from. Uh, CallRail, which is I think an amazing program, also analyzes the phone conversations you're having and identifies keywords used in phone calls so that you have more intelligence into buyer behavior. What are their most common questions? What products are they focusing in on? Uh, this can be very complex um, and you might want to reach out to a digital marketing firm to help you determine what software suite is going to work best for your needs. Um, whatever you do, do try and find a common inbox for your marketing and communications so that you never miss a lead. That's really why you're doing all this. Uh, I wanted to just focus in a little bit on what are some quick win tactics? What are some things that you can do right now to have the quickest wins to produce leads? If you're a marketing director out there and you're trying to sell the C-level on marketing software, this is something that's going to be important to you. You're gonna to wanna to show them immediately. This is what our inbound targets were and we immediately increased website traffic or leads coming into the system by X within a short amount of time. So the quick win tactics include chat, putting chat on your site if you don't have it. And that could be live chat or a chat bot. Creating meeting links if you have a sales team so that you're immediately getting uh, appointments with interested prospects. On-page SEO can really quickly affect your website traffic. Uh, and what I mean by that are title tags and SSLs and very simple things. Um, updating your Google local business center listing, claim your listing, update it, pop-ups on your website. I know that they can seem annoying, but um, people really, if they really are uh, applicable and relevant, then they can be helpful. And let's face it, advertising can be a little annoying. So most people are going to live through, they're not going to leave your website because it was a pop-up. And then some free and inexpensive software that you might want to think about. 
Um, just for total transparency, Inverve Marketing has been a HubSpot shop since 2012. It's a really vast ecosystem of technology and we really feel like it's the best one around there. One of the reasons why we really like it is because there's a suite of free tools that any marketer can get started with, or you can move into things that are as inexpensive as $50 a month. The nice thing about HubSpot is as you grow, you can grow into more um, sophisticated and intelligent tools with HubSpot. So you can turn on that free system, move into the pro version, and then if you end up being a Fortune 500, they've got an enterprise version for you as well. And you seamlessly move through those tools. So you never have to abandon a tool that you feel like you're really all in on. You can just move to the next version and it, you just open it up and more things are unlocked. Um, if you, uh, if you want to talk about HubSpot, please call me. I'm happy to help you get through these tools, uh, HubSpot or what have you. Also, um, Inverve Marketing is the HubSpot user group in town. So if you're already using HubSpot or if you're thinking of using HubSpot, uh, you've got a user group you can come to, you can ask questions, you can, um, and really we do focus on all kinds of digital marketing topics. Um, you can sign up for the HubSpot user group. We call it the hug on invermarketing.com and become part of uh, someone who gets a, uh, the emails about when they happen. Hugs happen quarterly, so they're not once a month or something like that. Very infrequent, four times a year. Um, so let's, one let's once again, let's review the framework thus far. You've benchmarked your inbound metrics. You know what your website traffic is, how many leads and how many customers. You've determined what your inbound targets are going to be, where in the funnel you're gonna be working. You have set your inbound goals. You've chosen the tactics that you're going to use to start out. The next step was building your marketing communication stack. And then you looked for some quick wins and implemented some things on your website or in your strategy. Um, if you're thinking about digital marketing holistically, you have to be thinking about marketing and sales alignment. We call that smarketing, sales and marketing. 85% of marketers with a service level, level agreement, a service level agreement, think that their marketing strategy is effective. So some things are just better together. Sales and marketing are one of those things that are better together. Marketing uh, when we when we work with larger accounts, we almost always have regular communication with the sales department and or meetings that are with sales and marketing. And one of the things that we like to provide them is a sales level agreement. Um, what does this mean? Um, so let me just first say 90% of sales and marketing professionals point to a number of disconnects across strategy, process, content, and culture. So sales and marketing are not aligning themselves to communicate in very important ways. Once you get your flywheel cranking, you really have to make sure it's running smoothly. It's, got, it's a very well-oiled machine. You have to identify and remove that friction from the flywheel. So those disconnects, when you make those connections, what you're doing is you're helping that flywheel really crank better. For example, if a visitor engages through chat and no one is manning the chat and that lead goes away, they find a competitor, they do business with them, you have lost a very viable lead. So you have to put some benchmarks and some practices in place that you commit to, you document, you put them in writing. And this happens both at big companies and very small companies. There are people who are one person marketing departments that have not yet identified what the marketing and sales alignment looks like. Uh, when, in larger companies today, it's now being called revenue optimization or RevOps and large corporations are actually have people who are dedicated to this new emerging discipline called RevOps. Service level agreements. Uh, your company should be transparent about documented marketing goals and sales goals. Even if you have one person in charge of sales and one person in charge of marketing, having them discuss a document like this is going to be productive. It'll always look a little different depending on you and your staff and your plan, 
but it will help you identify where is the friction in the flywheel, and then you can start to smooth things out. A cla classic example of misalignment is um, a visitor finds an offer, they, contacts a com they contact the company, and the person on the other end of the phone doesn't know, oh, I don't know about that promotion or offer. Uh, let me put you on hold for 10 minutes while I figure it out. So that is a very classic disconnect between sales and marketing. But sales should really know what marketing is doing. What is marketing's traffic goal? What is their lead goal per month? How do you determine what is a marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead? And then between the two, when a marketing qualified lead becomes a sales qualified lead, what is the behavior inside the company that picks that up? 60% of global respondents in a LinkedIn survey believe that misalignment between sales and marketing could damage financial performance. Once a sales, uh, once a sales and marketing team has agreed on what sales qualified lead looks like, for example, uh, a visitor has requested more information through a form, uh, they've downloaded a user guide, they've inquired uh, through chat, uh, whatever, whatever you determine that behavior is, that a marketing lead is now a sales lead, then the sales function of the flywheel, it's your accountability now to manage that lead. So what is that marketing to sales handoff? Document it. And then agree on what moves that prospect from a marketing qualified lead to a sales qualified lead. And then how and when does the sales team pick up that lead? Those are things that should be documented and they're conversations that should be ongoing. Uh, the last thing I wanna to touch on, I think it's close to the last thing I wanna to touch on is paid advertising. Um, you know, when we first started in 2012 with digital advertising, you could write 50 blogs and really move the needle for search engines. You could, you could start ranking for keywords. Uh, all kinds of things have changed though. And those good old days are really gone. Um, there's so much content marketing out there and so many people who are smart about keywords. Attracting traffic to your website probably is including paid digital ads today. Uh, what platforms you choose to advertise in entirely depends on your prospects. You should look for a vendor that you trust or use people that are running your digital marketing currently to do your paid advertising buys. Uh, it's just more complex than traditional advertising was and something that you don't wanna make mistakes on. And mistakes can be extremely costly. Um, knowing what you're doing in paid advertising is, uh, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of uh, certifications and education and things change very rapidly. Um, we happen to have had a, a client that we took on. This is several years ago now. They had somebody internally managing their Google search ads. And uh, when we got into the system, one of the things that we found was that they had separate ad groups that they had built. And in the bidding of keywords, those ad groups were bidding against each other. And it was costing them thousands of dollars a month. So we changed you know, we changed up how we were doing things. They stopped bidding against each other. And um, we had a lot more budget to work with, actually. Um, lastly, pay attention to what is behind that click. So if you've got a paid ad out there and somebody clicks on it, where do they go? That's really important. The Google algorithm isn't just looking at the ad. Uh, they measure the length of time on the page, downloads, clicks on that page, sharing that page, the quality of your landing page can affect things. So even if you're bidding the highest bid for that keyword, Google may determine that you're not the best ad because of a low quality score for that landing page. So you really need to know what you're doing. Pay attention to not just the ad, but where is it going? Uh, Lisa, Last time, we're gonna review one more time. Okay. Sorry. And I would just say we've got about five minutes and we can take a couple of questions. Um, so uh, we'll kind of do one quick review and then we'll jump into just a couple of questions we had. Great, okay, so this is the end of it. It's just a framework review and we can skip it. We've done all of that. We've looked for quick wins. We've aligned sales and marketing and we've addressed paid ads.
and you know what we'll just skip the next two they were like freebie little things that you can do and go to questions awesome so i've got a couple questions submitted um i know andrea uh one of our attendees she had some specific questions uh related to hubspot so we'll kind of let you two uh maybe chat and connect um you know offline uh, about her specific questions um, but what project management system do you use or recommend to kind of coordinate, um, you know, all of this information? Uh, project management wise for our clients, we, um, and for our own projects, we use teamwork. Um, we are in the enterprise version of that. So it, it connects with everything we do. It connects with HubSpot. It connects with, um, our billing, uh, QuickBooks online. Everything is really interconnected there. Awesome. Um, you know, you've mentioned a couple times these title tags and kind of these H1 markers. Can you talk a little bit more about what those are and how they directly impact, um, you know, the web searches and things of that nature? Yes. In fact, um, I'll go back here because that is something I was going to address. Um, so if you, this is a title tag, this is our website, Inverv Marketing, and if you hover over the tag at the top of the screen, a little box pops up. Now, very few people pay attention to this. It's called the title tag, and it's the title of your page. So this one happens to say Lansing, Michigan, marketing firm for web design, HubSpot, and then it says graphic design. Nobody reads this, nobody cares about this. Who cares about this is Google. So your title tag tells search engines what this page is about. It gives very rich keywords, Lansing, Michigan is important to us, Michigan, marketing firms, web design, HubSpot. So if your title tag is saying about us, that doesn't really help a search engine understand. About us might be about the best um, nonprofit in Michigan to feed people. You know, some, I don't know what it might be, but uh, you wanna pay attention to those title tags. It's really help. It just it's the it's the first thing you can do for SEO that's super helpful. Does that answer your question? Where do you where do you find that? How do you change that? Where? Uh, that's going to be on your website. So okay. um, yeah, and depending on your CMS, you know, you'll go in and change your title tags. Some of them kind of auto populate based on your content and your H1. Some of them don't. So if you want to again, give me a call uh, if you want to have a conversation about that. Sure. You know, we've talked a lot about landing pages and how critically important they are in kind of this process of moving somebody from just a visitor to, to a customer. Uh, can you talk maybe about some of the, the key components of landing pages, maybe provide a couple of really good examples of organizations or landing pages that you think are done really well um, to kind of give us a little bit uh, more grasp of that? Well, that's a great question. It's a very big question because landing pages can be used for all kinds of different things. I would say um, in the shortest answer, make sure that your landing pages authentically speak to what you're trying to achieve. What is the goal of that page? Uh, when we do keyword research and content plans, we create a list of, of keywords that are appropriate for that company. And then we model the page after that keyword. You really want one great idea on a landing page and uh, make sure that the keyword is in the title tag, in the URL, uh, in the headline of the landing page so it's optimized for search. And then make sure that that landing page delivers on what you're trying to say. So we've all had the experience where you go to a landing page and you think you're gonna get the top 10 foods that increase belly fat and you end up in this tangle of crazy, I can't find what I'm looking for. And search engines don't like it. And so just be helpful and direct and authentically speak because authenticity is something that that people people want, search engines want. No tricks in, there's no tricks in inbound. It's just real. Sure, kind of uh, doing what you say and saying what you're gonna do, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, just kind of our last question, it's, it's 11 o'clock, but I think we can get this one in here in a couple in a couple minutes. Um, you know, you talked about some of the basic metrics to be tracking, um, you know, to understand if your sales and marketing um, are A, working together and B, finding success. You know, you mentioned web traffic, you know, the conversion rate are, 
what should we, what should businesses be paying attention to in terms of these metrics to, to be able to judge whether or not they're having success? Well, the metrics that I shared today, they're called inbound targets in our world. Um, your inbound targets should be benchmarked monthly and you should keep a rolling average or have a dashboard that shows you what these inbound targets, the kind of growth that you're having. Now, if you're seasonal, your inbound targets might move up and down, but April to April in a season, if you're looking at that, uh, maybe that's your lowest traffic season, but if it's growing even based on that month, then you know you're doing a good job. Once you get these basic metrics down, you're going to start looking at far more complex things. Uh, our tracking is multiple spreadsheets for some of our clients that are that are much larger, and they might include the number of marketing qualified leads per month, the number of sales qualified leads per month, revenue attribution, a sources report, how much traffic's coming from social, what's the ROI on social. There's endless numbers of metrics and analytics that you can be pulling. I'm just giving you kind of that starting point for how to build a plan, how to think about the plan, and some of the tactics within that very simple basic framework that you can start using. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa, for A, the content, joining us today, um, you know, sharing your, your knowledge and your leadership um, on this issue. I mean, clearly, uh, you are very passionate about inbound marketing. And if we can get businesses to be just as passionate and utilize, um, you know, utilize these tools and resources that are available, I think it's going to be really beneficial for them. Um, as we kind of wrap up uh, the, the program today, uh, we will send a follow-up email um, with Lisa's contact information, um, links to, to the next hug uh, in, in Lansing, and uh, we'll, we'll get some folks engaged uh, via, via that way. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to the chamber or to Lisa for any questions. Um, if you need any information on anything related uh, to the COVID crisis, please visit our uh, relaunch, uh, Greater Lansing. Uh, web page or our resources page for information. That's at lansingchamber.org. Um, with that being said, I will wrap up today's presentation. Uh, thank you again, Lisa, and of course, Jody and uh, the team at uh, Fraser Law Firm for your sponsorship. And uh, go and make it a wonderful Thursday. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, Lisa. Bye, everybody. <laughs>